So presumably hand in hand, you know, is you, you talk about in, in part two of your article, you, you talk about mm -hmm. the numbers of um, surfers that there are in the US. You, you talk about the number of people that swing a club. Right. Compared to what is it, 93,000 rowers. And, and so part of um, a vision would be that that 93,000 would be what? I mean, what's the capacity for rowing? Just say in the U.S. Well, I, I, I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I think golf is a great example of what our potential could be. There, you know, if you think about it, they're very, very similar experiences. They're outside. Um, a lot of view, people view them as expensive hobbies, um, but yet, you know, the, at least in the United States, access to golf is 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 pretty broad. You know, you have public courses that people can access, and you know, go and I mean, I'm not a golfer, so I don't know what the greens fees are to, to, to go out and do 18 for a day. But, um, but you know, people, I've known people from all income classes that, that golf. Um, and so I, I, I think that, uh, and then, you know, so in terms of the barriers to entry, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, it is a highly, it's a, it's a um, complex skill set. Right. I have tried to learn how to swing a golf club. I'm not very good at it. Um, and uh, I imagine those first swings I took were similar to the first strokes that you see a novice take in that uh, in that big wary, right? Awkward and um, and uh, sort of uh, sort of unaware. Um, so it's not any harder to learn how to row than say it is to learn how to golf. Um, and you know, you, you could talk about the cost of equipment, but I think that's another area that we could stand to to, to look at you know, for just to sort of tangentially work with talk about equipment, you know, that the cost of equipment doesn't need to be as high as it is. You know, we have manufacturers using very, very expensive materials yeah. to make high performance racing shells um, that we don't, we don't, you know, somebody doesn't need to to learn how to row in a brand new Empocker. And, you know, and even the, the, the sort of lower tier, if you will, recreational shells can be seen as, uh, somewhat expensive, but that's because I think the volume on, of sales on those on those boats are so low. You know, if you were to introduce more volume, um, I think manufacturers uh, would be more inspired to get into the space. You know, you can't go into a sporting goods store and purchase a rowing shell. You can't go buy a plastic kayak, but you can't get a rowing shell. Now, wouldn't yeah. that be neat if, if you could? Um, you know, it, it's sort of like, if you wanted to go cycling, if you wanted to go just for a cruise down the beach on your bike, but your only option is a ten thousand dollar touring bike, right? <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, it it's kind of absurd, right? And it, it's not the fault of the manufacturers. This is where the demand is right now. Um, but I think as we bring, if we were to bring more people into the sport, improve the experience, uh, make it more accessible in terms of uh, friendliness, you know, um, uh, then, then, you know, that might change. Um, so, that is, yeah, go ahead. So how, how do you bring, start this process of bringing more people into the sport? What, and, and, and what is chicken and egg with this? Is it you raise fees first and then you try and bring more people in or, you know, how do you have a, a kind of a plan in your mind that would be, uh, a way of, achieving you know monetizing rowing basically yeah i mean i think the, the the first step and again this is the hardest this may be the hardest pill for people to swallow is we need to start charging more i mean that's 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 the first thing right and that's going to be really really challenging for some people uh, but again I'll, I'll call the bluff a little bit and say i i've never had a conversation as a as a club leader as a team leader i've never had a conversation with anybody saying I can't afford it anymore. I'm quitting. Um, and then you look at what more people are paying for other sports. Uh, you know, pe more people are paying more for other activities. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, part of my language, I'm going to call BS a little bit on the uh, we yeah. can't afford the club dues. So that would be the first thing is we need to raise the club dues. Okay. Um, we need to put more money back into our our, our individual clubs, right? So that we can improve the facility, improve the equipment, bring more learn to row 
equipment in instead instead of investing in um you know and I'm, I'm sorry i don't know what the exchange rate is but instead of investing in the sixty thousand dollar uh you know empocker here in the united states let's let's purchase more wherries let's purchase more learn to row open water learn to row wide body rowing shells um and then you can improve the aesthetic of your club right how many clubs have a dedicated cleaning staff that they pay to come in and sweep the bays not just once a week or once a month but every day that clean the bathrooms right um, i think all these things contribute to the experience of someone when they first step into the club i will say i've i've lost students because they've one step into the club they look around and they're like no i'm not you know this is this is not what i expected you know i i heard a great podcast a number of years ago that was talking about the novice experience and compared it to a you know if you were to go to a tennis lesson for your first time uh your first tennis lesson and you go to the tennis club and the first thing that happens is they take you to the back of the club and this old court where it's cracked there's weeds coming up out of the ground the net is drooping and uh they get they hand you a broken racket and then the the the, the course the instructor learned to play tennis six months ago and that's that's kind of the novice experience the first time exposure for a lot of people particularly in the united states um that they they you know they're given old equipment you know they tie into this boat which may be cracked and have old cruddy shoes um and and i'm not saying that they need to have the top of the line stuff but like, again we need to change that experience um and uh and so yeah so the first thing certainly is i think i think we need to charge more for what we're doing yeah yeah carry on i i'll that was an interesting point that just came up from uh mm -hmm. from uh love Ryan there but um the first thing is charge more then right. then, then right. what well and then i think we need to take a hard look at um at privatization you know i say that in the article is, is starting yeah. to move these clubs away from the nonprofit, and i use nonprofit. that's sort of colloquially what we say in the united states i don't know if there's a similar term in the uk um uh, but uh charity, more spaces, I charity, guess. charity right you know so we need to move these clubs over to a private model you know a lot of time what comes up in the conversations is well, we need more investment we need more investment in the sport well you can't have invest investment unless there's a payout right you can talk about the community benefit you can talk about um you know teaching underserved communities or giving them access to the sport into the outside into the water um but you know frankly there is a lot more charities that bring a lot more good that are or that are you know can be more appealing you know the cancer charities uh you know i mean it's there's a million things that fall ahead of rowing when people people give money so you want investment you have to you have to attach some kind of dividend to that investment and so i think um privatizing those clubs and again i wouldn't know what the process what the legal process is would be in the uk but there is a path in the united states to do that it's not easy um but i think if you highlight and then here's the other point these nonprofit clubs that are functioning as charities okay i think we could agree that a lot of the members of these clubs are don't necessarily need to benefit from charity you know when you look at some of the cars that are driving up and parking at these clubs yeah um then you know it it, it you start to wonder okay is this really a a charitable organization or um is this is this sort of a uh a, it, it, I, don't, I don't mean to be cynical about it right but you know you gotta kind of say like okay people give money they support the club and who's benefiting who's benefiting so yeah so so moving basically moving from non-profit to, to to private so who's gonna invest in rowing clubs you're, you're talking about entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in effect giving the club a, a, a good deal of money in return mm -hmm. or how how's practically that going to work john 
Well, I think you have to find those investors that are, and I don't think it requires a tremendous amount of investment. You know, you have to, you have to have the business plan. Um, you have to be able to present like, this is a sustainable business. This is what the operational costs are. This is what we're going to charge. Um, and, um, I don't think it requires that much investment. I don't think you need 30 million. I don't think you even think you need 10 million. I think, you know, even a small business loan of a hundred thousand dollars. And again, I'm sorry, I'm working in uh, dollars. I yeah. don't know what the exchange rate is, but even a small business loan, I think is enough to get a club to the point where, um, uh, where it can purchase the equipment. And, and I'm sorry, let me, let me take a step back. The step is towards privatization. You create the business, right? Because you can't buy a nonprofit. Nobody owns a nonprofit. Mm. You create the business. The business purchases the assets of the nonprofit. Okay. The nonprofit still exists. Yeah. The nonprofit takes the liquidity from that purchase and puts it into um, either dispenses it to other charities or nonprofits, or ideally, here's this for an idea, takes the liquidity from the purchase of those assets and puts it into a charitable foundation or endowment that does, in fact, go directly into the underserved community. Yeah, there's a point that um, Adrian Casti um who um is listening he, he said his concern is if you're you know you're concerned about diversity and underprivileged mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. which you know uh, is one of the weaker spots of rowing how does mm -hmm. how does that pricing model change the access to those communities to well, I, the sport sure i think you know in our club currently um, we have, you know, we would be considered on the, on the more expensive, you know, I think we charge $3,000 a year, a little around $3,000 a year for, really? athletes. yeah, uh, but that's all inclusive. So that's all travel gear, everything, um, hotel, bus, um, some food. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot, but we also, you know, it's going directly back to the athletes. Um, but we also offer financial aid for people that, uh, that qualify that can't afford it. So I think, and in particular, if you start charging more, then your club has, you know, has the, the, the bottom line budget to start, um, you know, to start bringing in people that maybe can't afford it. Right. And then, you know, you have a financial aid process and so on and so forth, but, but right now, you know, or maybe you could take that extra, you know, some of the extra cash and put that into transportation to bring, people that, you know, don't have access because of transportation to the club, right? Um, that's something that's been uh, 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 an example that's been proven out here in the United States where some clubs have actually, through grants, purchased passenger vans and they've gone to the local inner city school, picked up the kids and brought them to the club. So I, I, I don't, again, I'll push back on that a little bit because I don't think increasing the dues is going to immediately cause everybody to quit or restrict access. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think the more money you bring into the club through the dues process or, or through increasing dues, the more accessibility you're going to create because the, all of a sudden you have, um, you know, you, you, you have money that you can leverage towards allowing greater access. Right now, rowing clubs are extremely poor. I think everybody agrees about that, right? Like, you know, and, I, and, and I'll say like, okay, well, we've been doing it a certain way for the last 70, 80 years. And we don't have the diversity. We don't have the inclusion. So what have we got to lose? Yeah. The, um, I, I guess the model that you uh, that you think of in terms of the US is there's a lot of, you know, um, rich donors who have been to college and have made, mm -hmm. you know, quite a few Right. So on Wall Street, I, I, you know, I'm thinking of um, the way that it, the new rowing center in Brooklyn was funded. Right. Bro, on uh, yes. Brooklyn River. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm also thinking of, you know, the way that U.S. rowing is is funded as well, um, right. which, which is by kind of philanthropic donation, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think. So I, I'm wondering if the system in the U.S. is so people are so used to that kind of model, 
you know, um, a sugar daddy may be coming with a, with a lot of money that um, the desire to privatize just isn't there. Yeah, I, I, I think I think certainly there's, you know, there's going to be some pushback there, um, I think. Um, but I, I also think that maybe we could shine a light on some of these charities. And let me sorry, let me back up, you know, real charities like, you know, like a, um, a program like Row New York or community rowing in Boston. We have a club, Row LA, um, and here in Los Angeles that specifically target, target's not the right word, cater to underserved communities, right? Um, those are outstanding organizations and, and, and we need to support them and continue to help them grow uh, as much as possible. What I'm shining a light on is those clubs that function as nonprofits, it's charities, but are not serving underserved communities, right? Almost exclusively not serving those communities. Um, and, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like uh, an accusation, but I think the step towards moving our sport forward, improving the experience, getting more people involved is by bringing more money into it, growing these clubs into private organizations that are, you know, that are investment worthy, that generate income, that somebody, if they put down half a million or even a million dollars, that they're going to see, you know, 10, 15 percent, uh, you know, optimally, or maybe it's even even if it's just five or 10 percent, that's investment worthy for some people. Do you think the right people are running clubs that 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 actually that there's the environment to make that happen? Um, yes and no. I think there are some some clubs that are ready to 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 to, to pick that up, but I do think there is probably some legacy players that are going to dig their heels in um, because again they're used to paying two hundred dollars a year for their access. They don't understand why if it works for them why it needs to change. Um, you know, I've spoken with clubs in the past that have flat out told me we're not interested in growing. We're not interested in bringing in new members. Um, we're not interested in teaching people how to row. We just want our little club and, and you know, and, and, and maybe that's okay. Um, but I think as, as someone I, you know, I consider myself to be a growth minded individual. I am yeah. always trying to move forward as a coach in our sport. I love our sport. I want to, um, broaden its appeal. Um, I think, I think, I'm pretty convinced that this is the way to go. Yeah. Um, there's this There's this question here, um, which we talked about before we went on air, about the in Boston, the CRI mm -hmm. model, which which I think on terms of bums per seat, you know, mm -hmm. getting people through, they have a they have a really effective model, don't they? Yeah. I mean, they're an outstanding organization. I mean, they were, you know, they've been around, I think they started in the mid eighties. Um, so somebody do the math for me. What is that? 35 years. Um, so, and, and, and it really, and they were growing consistently. I even wrote out of there for a little bit with their master's men, um, just, uh, you know, great experience, great setup. Um, and then, you know, they were able to, uh, through charitable gifts, build the, the Harry Parker boathouse, which is a fantastic facility. Um, and then Bruce Smith came on board, uh, as a CEO, and he, over 10 years, you know, he's now, if people aren't familiar, he's now the CEO of Hydro, the, the, the oh. indoor rowing machine company. Um, and he just did an amazing job there. Um, and they really, really blew up. And uh, in terms of access, absolutely. I would give them a very, very hard look as a model to follow in terms of access and, um, and providing for um, all communities. I mean, they have... You know, they run a, a Paralympic uh, training center out of there. So they have elite athletes rowing out of that facility, uh, but they're also still running learn to row classes. And, and uh, again, um, uh, sessions for underserved, uh, underserved communities. So uh, yeah, absolutely. CRI is an outstanding example for that. Mm -hmm.